thanks to everyone who um, joined us in person tonight. We're still sort of, you know, playing it as we go. Um, I know that we have a lot of people signed up online, but they may taper in over time, so we'll just see what happens. Tonight, we're going to tell you a little bit of a story, a journey um, about um, developing therapeutic cell populations and how you move out of the lab and basic science and into translation that requires CGMP scale up. So I call this a, a hitchhiker's guide because I'm really the hitchhiker here. When I started my lab at UCI, my lab worked on questions about the immune system and its role in spinal cord injury. We had a very kind of niche set of models about spinal cord injury. And um, we were approached not long after I was um, first here. Uh, I was approached by a company that was developing one of the first therapeutic neural stem cell products um, that was, uh, uh, had been identified in, in the U.S. They had developed the protocols to be able to isolate neural stem cells from human brain, and they were looking for applications for this. So they came and said, you have these unique models, and we would like you to transplant our cells and see what happens in spinal cord injury. And that's how I started to become a stem cell biologist about 20 years ago now. So I am the hitchhiker in this game. So that's our story. And uh, along with that, we happen to be in the process of um, building out and completing a good manufacturing practice, GMP facility here at UCI. So joining me, I will have, we will have the director of that facility, Roberta Marino, who is new to UCI and is integrally involved in terms of setting up that processing facility. We're gonna tell you between us a little bit about my story with spinal cord injury and stem cells and her role in developing that CGMP facility. Um, that's, uh, we're super excited about here and UCI has made it a huge investment in. So I am Eileen Anderson, for those of you who haven't met me, I'm the director of the UCI Sue and Bill Gross Stem Cell Research Center here. I have my PhD from the University of California, Irvine. After a short sojourn out to Harvard, I came back um, here just about 20 years ago and started my lab. And you just heard the backstory to that. Roberta, you are online. Can you say a few words about yourself by way of introduction? Yes, hi, how are you, Aline? Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, so I'm Roberta Marino, the new CGMP director for UCI. And uh, I'm originally from Brazil, Sao Paulo. And uh, I developed my PhD in pediatric science, uh, regenerative medicine. I came to US to develop my postdoc fellowship at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And then I did, I went to Madison, Wisconsin as well for my fellowship. And I, um, I joined St. Jude um, uh, as a, um, a scientist. And uh, after many years, actually, uh, like a, pretty much like seven years or so, I joined the CGMP facility at St. Jude. And uh, as, a, as a senior scientist and working on the process development and manufacture of cell engine therapy products. Okay, so um, a couple of words just to start with. Here we go. Um, first, a huge thank you, particularly tonight. Roberta, unfortunately, couldn't be here this evening, so we're doing this remote but dual presentation, remote to in-person. Um, Brian Cummings and uh, um, Kyle Good um, have been hugely uh, at work over the last 30 minutes, problem solving our audio problems. Thank you, Zoom, for upgrading once again. Um, but it looks like we are all settled now. And of course, Judy Beck, who is our uh, Master of Communications in the center, who's at the back. We couldn't do these things without her. Um, how can I help? I'm gonna start out with this slide for the center. The most important thing you can do is be here tonight, participate in some way, sign up, follow our newsletter, follow us on Facebook, visit our website and hear more about us. And of course, we are always looking for the community to participate by making a gift or contributing via th philanthropy. And if you're interested in that, we urge you to contact Amber Harness. A critical thing is that research, while it drives the UC, the uh, not just the UCI economy, the US economy, um, a very small amount of philanthropic gifts actually go to um, academic research. And so that's something that we're always trying to encourage here at UCI. A couple of words on format. We're gonna do our speaker presentations because of the hybrid mode without taking questions from the audience. But at the end, we will come back and try and answer all of the questions that you have, either the people here in the room or those that are um, participating by online. If you're online, you can put your questions into the Q&A box. We'll be monitoring that at the end and doing a moderated discussion to try and be sure that we cover as many of those as possible. 
So with that, I'm going to start my introduction. So um, I mentioned how this Hitchhiker's Guide began. So first, I'm going to start out by talking just a moment about spinal cord injury and cell transplantation and how um, that works. So this, you guys should be able to see my cursor, both online and in the audience, is the site of a spinal cord injury, a cartoon of that. And what happens in most people with spinal cord injuries, there's a contusion or a compression that causes uh, an injury site that goes necrotic. In other words, all the cells that are there die over time, and that results in a loss of connection. We can't send signals from our brain down our spinal cord to our muscles, and ascending sensory information from your periphery, your legs and your arms is disrupted. Those signals don't get up to the brain. So we get a connection block. Partial or complete, it depends upon the level of the injury. And there's a complex set of things that go wrong that involve the inflammation that occurs in the system, the inflammatory response, as I mentioned, that's what I started by studying in my lab, and um, the loss of those fibers, those connections, and the insulation around them over time. So this is a dynamic environment. It changes over time. There are a lot of things that go wrong, but it was viewed early on as having a lot of potential to think about cell therapeutics because you lose a population of cells. And it seemed like an idea that if you could just replace that population or make the ones that are spared work better, that this would be a good target. Hence the application or the attempt to apply, um, as I mentioned, some of these early neural stem cell therapeutics to spinal cord injury is a problem. And in fact, my lab and others with Brian Cummings, who's here tonight, showed early on that in fact you can transplant human neural stem cells into the injured spinal cord and get a pretty good amount of repair, certainly in animal models. So you can see on the left side here, this is an animal that received a vehicle. And if you look, her forelimbs and her hind limbs are not able to move together. And her hind limbs can't always take steps. She misses a lot of steps. But the cell transplanted animal on the, on the opposite side, the right side as you're facing the screen, this animal is consistently placing with their hind limbs. And they're able to maintain a one-to-one -one pattern of locomotion between their forelimbs and their hind limbs. That is a lot of recovery in a mouse animal model to go from incomplete or incapacity to be able to step to be able to move fully with coordination. So this was pretty exciting when we first had this data. And it led within eight years of that initial video being taken to actually a first in human clinical trial for spinal cord injury with these human neural stem cell populations. We targeted thoracic spinal cord injury and the design of the clinical trial looked like this. So I'm not gonna walk through this all in detail. We had a lot of safety data on these cells. So we were able to do what's called allometric scaling. So we took the dose that had worked in a mouse and calculated what an equivalent size of dose would be for a human spinal cord and gave that to these individuals with spinal cord injury. That was 20 million cells for the human uh, subjects that were transplanted. 12 subjects with a thoracic injury, so this is anywhere along the spinal column, um, sort of in the middle. And we targeted this chronic period, three to 12 months after injury. The most important thing about this kind of early clinical trial, which was a phase one, two combined, is you're looking for first safety. So we wanna do no harm in humans with these injuries and for any potential readouts in terms of efficacy. And in fact, we got both. We had no um, significant safety issues that were identified in this study. And in fact, we had a number of patients, three of seven complete, that's what AISA is, and four out of five incomplete, so people who had a little bit of sparing in terms of function showed improvement. And in fact, we had two conversions, two patients who were complete injuries converted to being incomplete injuries in the course of this trial. So that was really exciting. In terms of incomplete conversions, it looks like this. So everything in this individual, this was the third subject that was enrolled in the trial, and he received his cells four months after his injury. Everything here that was in red was a loss of function, so he was unable to feel anything in that zone or below. But after um, about six months, he had converted to partial sensation all throughout his trunk. So this was really exciting. In fact, um, long-term follow-up of these subjects over six to 10 years after these initial transplants um, resulted in a pretty good consensus that that damaged spinal cord is a suitable target, as you can see here, for cell transplantation. And that's what a phase one, two trial is. We didn't know if we could do these kinds of injections into the human spinal cord at a dose that had any therapeutic potential um, in a safe way, in a way that would be well tolerated by the subjects. So again, even in long-term follow-up, this was pretty exciting data. 
But along that path, what we found was that this isn't always the case. And um, here is where the story of CGMP and manufacturing begins. So in uh, a follow-up set of studies where we were attempting, uh, Dr. Cummings and I, to move this work from thoracic spinal cord injury to cervical spinal cord injury, there were some changes made at the company that we were working with. We got cells that were intended to go to clinical trial that in our hands, in our animal models, didn't work. And this was wildly distressing to us, as you can imagine. We published a set of papers. We had some very public disagreements about what was going on in terms of those cells. Um, because in our hands, all of the preclinical efficacy data with those new cells that had been manufactured failed. So human neural stem cells have the capacity, in our view, to give this exciting repair for human neurological disease, for spinal cord injury in this case. But they didn't always, and we didn't understand why at all. So one of the first things I want to have you take home tonight is that understanding why stem cells work and why they behave in specific ways is really important, not just for a me from a mechanistic point of view for understanding how those cells work, but in terms of clinical translation. And in our opinion at that time, we were very concerned that the translational failure that we were seeing in our hands, our, pre, our preclinical work, had to do with scale up and how the cells were being manufactured. And that launched us down the path of thinking about that a whole big bunch. And so with that, I want to introduce to you the idea of what good practice is in terms of working in lab at both the preclinical and the clinical translation stages, and what a regulatory environment is and how important that is in terms of anything that we do with cell or regenerative medicine um, in terms of translation trying to move towards human disease. So those of you who have seen me um, give a talk here before and other contexts are kind of familiar probably with this leader. Um, and this is the idea that all the research that we do here at an academic institution moves from bench on towards bedside, right? So very basic science discovery on into what we hope will be clinical translation. And that's just illustrated here. The first step is our very basic idea, right? Our discovery research that we do at the lab. The second step is when we as basic scientists or clinical scientists are trying to move through the steps that are going to prove the potential for repair for an effect in an animal model, for example, right? And then a third step would be, as I just showed you, moving on into clinical trial, an early stage clinical trial to see if those data hold up and to see if there's a good safety profile that would warrant um, going further. But I want to bring out a point here in terms of cellular therapeutics in particular and some of the limitations that we have with those. So in everything that I showed you about um, a study that is a preclinical study in animal models, we're using 100,000 cells total per animal. So here in a mouse is our subject. Tens of subjects, right? 15, maybe 20 animals in a study. So maybe 20 million cells total for an entire preclinical study. But when we talk about clinical translation, as I mentioned, right, we were able to do allometric scaling. So that's 20 million cells per subject, in that case, place, case a human, hundreds of subjects. So you get pretty quickly to upwards of 10 billion cells or more that you might have to manufacture. So let's think about that for a second. This is what we call scale up, and this is a huge problem in terms of cell therapies and why it's so important to think about this in advance. So if we visualize these numbers as pennies that are stacked on top of one another, what's the difference between 1 million and 10 billion? 1 million is about a mile in distance of pennies. That's the distance that you uh, would walk if you were to walk across this campus to the other side of campus from where you're standing right now. 1 billion would be the distance if you line those up from here to Denver, and then do that 10 times. And that's what we're talking about in terms of scale up. It's a massive difference, right? And so this is critically important in the case of cell therapeutics and cell manufacturing. So if we come back to our slide here, where we're talking about discovery steps and the third step to clinical trial, you can think, pretty quickly that that's going to require some extensive regulatory considerations in order to be able to do it responsibly and in order to be able to do it well. And that's because we have to worry about patient safety, that do no harm issue. We have to worry about the consistency of that cell manufacture. It's not going to happen overnight, right, to get from uh, uh, 
a starting single cell population on up into the billions to be able to deliver on a clinical perspective and to ensure the safety of our cellular products. And so I am going to pause there and Roberta, who I'm going to make large, is going to tell you um, and give about good laboratory practice, good manufacturing practice, and good clinical practice and give you an introduction to what CGMP means. Roberta, you're on. Okay, thanks, Aline. So um, what I want to point out at this point in time is the importance of the GMP, as Aline mentioned, it's uh, especially the scale up. It's extremely important to keep the quality of the product, keep the safety and everything, actually. So um, pretty much what I want to show you here is that we need to think it only once. It's, it's one big picture. So regarding the good laboratory practice, it's extremely important for you to have all your research well documented in case you need to go back. In, is, in case you have an, somebody come for an audit, you need to have that really well documented so you can prove everything that you need. And you can go back in case there is a need as well. So the, the second point that is extremely important is the materials actually you need to, to trace. So you, you need to have the lot number, you need to have where this material is coming from, everything documented. It's, it's documentation from the start, from the end, actually. And this is the only way that you pretty much can translate your work from the research to the clinic, so it, in the safest way. So um, this is the main idea, actually, of the GMP facility. It's a lot of regulatory uh, things that we need to take care of it, but this is because we need to make sure that whatever is coming to the patient later on, actually, it will be it will be okay for the patient to receive it. And, and, and if there is any need, we can go back and trace. So this is the, the important thing. Next, Aline, please. So the meaning of the GTP compared with the GMP, actually, what this means. So the GTP, which is the good uh, tissue practice, it's pretty much that we need to kind of like ensure that the products are not contaminated during the manufacturing. So this is, uh, this is the idea. Um, and then the product, product for function and integrity is not, uh, it's, it's okay, you know, like we need to keep it in a way that it will be safe. So the GMP facility, it's, the, it's a type of environment that will be handling all this kind of products from cell and gene therapy. And it's a control environment. You will see it's ISO 7 highly controlled. It's extremely clean. It's an environment that you pretty much is uh, the cleanest environment you will ever see in your life, actually. And, um, and this is because we want a product that will be uncontaminated, will be no contamination at all, and it's sterile, and as, as safe as possible to the patient. Next link, please. So this is the interesting part. So the, once you're kind of going from your research lab, as you can see, as you, you, you can wear whatever you want. You can wear jeans, you can wear regular lab coats. Your, your, your uh, cell culture space, actually, you, you don't need to care much, right? You do need, because you still need to clean it up and everything, but you still can kind of, you will have the flexibility for you to do whatever you want. Once you transition from your research discovery area, right, you will be troubleshooting whatever you need to troubleshoot, moving towards the GMP facility, it's a totally different environment, which you will need to care from your gowning, cleaning, and pretty much everything. So uh, this is the beauty of it. So when you see you kind of move from your lab, your regular lab, uh, and then you transition from your lab to the GMP facility, it's a totally different world, which is a world that you need to care as much as with the minimal things from cleaning to gowning and to make sure that every single thing that you write it down, it's well documented in a way that you can trace back. Next link, please. So in a way, I think the way that I see the GMP facility is the same way as I see like I'm pretty much like an, um, an, a philharmonic actually, which uh, you will have your conductor, you will have the violin, you will have, you know, every single, the cello, everybody playing different instruments. So the GMP, and, and then the idea is that every single person, every single department will be a specific, right? The same way with your philharmonic, actually. So the violinist will play the violin, the cello will play the cello, so it won't be overlap. And they need to come as one, right? The beauty of it. 
So the GMP facility is pretty much the same thing. You will have different groups that will be pretty much uh, in, they will kind of like touch, what I mean, like touch base with each other. So they will communicate, which is extremely important inside a GMP facility. Communication is extremely, extremely important. So you will have different groups. So you have, for example, the quality assurance group, which will be the group that I consider the ones that will be handling all the, pretty much all the regulatory aspects. So there is two principles for the quality assurance group. So the fit for purpose, which the product should be suitable for the intended purpose and right first time. So no mistakes should, should you cannot, we should avoid mistakes actually. So this is the, so this is for the quality assurance. The quality control group is a group pretty much that will be handling all the assays, all different kinds of assays or QPCR, flow cytometry, doesn't mean like even uh, if you need a sorting, uh, it, it, all different kinds of assay and the toxins. So they will be handling that. So the process development will be the group that will be pretty much developing your um, your research. Like you kind of, sometimes you need to have the process development because we need to somehow uh, work a little bit of things inside the GMP. But ideally speaking, all the process development should be handling out in the, in the regular lab. So you can pretty much troubleshoot everything that you need and then just bring it, once you're ready, bring it to the, bring it to the GMP, well said. But sometimes we need to troubleshoot things especially scaling up because you won't be able, for example, to handle in a regular lab, you won't be able to handle like a bioreactor, right? So we need to kind of like, this needs to keep happen inside a GMP facility. So the manufacturing group is the one that will be hands-on with the product actually. So they will be uh, performing the, 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 the work itself, uh, scale like handling all, if it's a, uh, uh, CAR T protocol. They will be handling the, the entire the entire process from receiving uh, receiving the uh, the sample and processing that, and pretty much it's the entire process actually that the manufacturer will be handling. And the materials management, it's it's extremely important to have that because this will be the the group that you will have it in a way that you kind of the, receive the product right. So. Once you're have, having from the clinic, you have your, your bag with the, with the product itself, and then you need to write it down a couple of things uh, for checking in the product pretty much. And not only this, but this group will be also handling with all the minimum like media, cytokines, they will be receiving all of that. And they will be the one actually transfer your material. For example, once you're done with the manufacturing, transfer your material to the liquid nitrogen and making sure that it's well, um, that it's well stored. Next, link, please. So a couple of things that I want to highlight here is that the principles of the GMP, actually, I want to, there is a couple of them that we need to pay attention. One is the step-by-step -step written procedure. So this is extremely important because if nothing is written, if there is no, nothing written, it never happens, actually. So it's extremely important that you need to follow up the procedures. You cannot just shortcut. There is no shortcut in the GMP. Uh, document is pretty much, you, you need to document everything. You need to validate your work, make sure that your work is work, working well the way it should be. Uh, you need the, to keep the facility, not only the facility, but the, the equipment itself well calibrated, function in a perfect way, because if something goes wrong, this might affect your manufacturing, then this is it. So we cannot, we cannot, we need to avoid that. So we need to pretty much make it perfect. And uh, the other important thing is that we need to, um, from time to time, we need to kind of like uh, the personnel itself, we need to work on a competency. So they need to get to receive proper training, not only on the SOPs, but proper training. Let's say if they're performing like a cell isolation from time to time, even though if they do this as a routine actually thing, they need to kind of go back and, and, and kind of like, perform the S, perform everything again, because and then we need to document it and make sure, okay, this is good for one year, sign, date, and make it sure that it's, we can keep the record for any kind of uh, future need. The other things that GMP facility, once you join a GMP facility, the first thing that you need to keep in mind, you will be cleaning the whole time. This is the main point of the GMP, is as clean as possible. This is like, needs to be your daily habit, because you cannot have any kind of foreign pathology or any kind of bacteria around. So as clean as possible, you need. And 
again, for time to time, actually, you need to kind of, the, the, once your facility has all your documents, you can, I can guarantee nothing will happen. You, if, if there is an audit or anything like that, I can, they will pass. But again, you need to have things well documented in a way that if something comes, you will be covered. So this is the main idea, actually. Um, next selling, please. So this is just one uh, one uh, one slide that I want to show is that this is um, people also like mentioned there was a lot of CAR T protocols around and uh, I just want to point one thing where uh, we started where where the so the the the, the GMP went uh, where when we started actually so this is an example of a patient which will be receiving a, a CD19 CAR T for B uh, acute lymphoblastic leukemia. So the sample will come to the GMP facility and we will kind of receive it. QA will get involved, materials manager will get involved, manufacturer directory will get involved. So everybody's involved on the receiving part actually to make sure that every single piece of the paperwork, it's well documented and we do have everything before starting any kind of uh, procedure. So we need to have the, the consent from the patient. So everything needs to be there before, any, before touching the product actually. So once we do have a product, in our, product uh, in our hands, we will thaw it. Normally we receive it as a frozen. So we'll thaw the product, we'll uh, select the cell CD4 and CD8, activate the cells. Then we'll modify with the antivirus. We'll expand them normally. The, this is the way that we are uh, normally uh, working on it. Check bioprofile to make sure that the cells are proliferating in a good way. Lactose, glucose measurements. On day seven, actually, it's a harvest day. So then we'll perform all different kinds of assays, sterility tests, and a toxin to make sure that enough that the, the, the sample is perfect for infusion, cryopreserve, and once the patient is ready, ship it to the patient, they will receive that. So this is the way it normally works. Like for this kind of protocol, it takes like normally seven days, and it's an extremely time-consuming, actually, right now. Uh, this is like this is not an automated uh, this is not an automated way to go. So we do have other techniques right now, especially um, what's interesting that just came out. It's like the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. It's uh, creating like a 24 uh, 24 uh, hours uh, uh, protocol, which is amazing actually. So this is another thing that we need to kind of keep in mind. So it's a still we're still trying to improve that to kind of reduce the time, right? So creating like an automated system for that. And the labeling part, which is extremely important. So we need to kind of think on a label. So once we are in the GMP facility, uh, you need to kind of, it's an, we need to follow the ISBT labeling system. So this will provide all kinds of different uh, information. So what the product is, what type of percentage of DMSO prior preservation. So the, until when we can use the product, uh, sometimes we do have the ABO information and then I, it's useful because you can pretty much match with the document and say, okay, this is from the patient. It's a double checking procedure that we normally do. So this is, uh, it, it, so this is the way that we, we should follow actually. So follow the, uh, the ISPT, um, guidance. Next, the link, please. So this is just for us to have a general idea what CIRM and the Alpha Stem Cell Clinic Network. So we do have multiple trials going on. Uh, there are a couple of them that will be on phase three trials uh, in different, uh, so we do have from ALS, we do have uh, cancer, SCID. And I want to point it out here how important, it's extremely important for us to move. If we want to move from bench to bedside, actually, not, but we need to kind of have a GMP facility to make sure that we can accomplish and make all these trials uh, somehow happen actually. So we need to kind of keep the things moving and uh, applying in multiple directions. Next selling, please. Okay, that's my cue to come back. Sorry, Roberta, I'm gonna send you away again into the ether. There you go. Um, and so with all of that kind of background, let's come back to this particular question understanding why stem cells behave in specific ways and why it is important for basic science and as I've tried to show you for clinical translation. So this is the part we want to talk about. What's next in the case of spinal cord injury? And to answer that, I need to back up one step and tell you a little bit more about stem cells and the environments they occupy and the things that influence them. So all stem cells occupy a place in the environment that's a very specific kind of place. We call it a niche. And that niche is 
you know, illustrated here in a more uh, constructionist kind of niche, um, your basic stem cell and your basic niche. It's a place that that cell sits in and it's listening to the signals to the structure that's around it. But that niche is not always the same. It can vary over time and it might be different for depending upon a different cell. So it can uh, look different in terms of structure it can be in various stages of being broken down or damaged, like in the case of the injured spinal cord. It can be in an ongoing state of repair or where the body is attempting to repair itself. And those all present different cues, different information to a stem cell. On top of that, no two stem cell lines, at least, are truly identical. The cells themselves have different sorts of properties that define them and affect how they behave even if they're all in the same category of cell. So for example, you can imagine you might have neural stem cell line one, two, and three, but they are not exactly the same. They all fall in the category of neural stem cell, but they're not exactly the same. On top of that, we have a couple of things. So I've just introduced to you the idea that there are extrinsic factors, things that are in that stem cell niche, and intrinsic factors that are about the particular stem cell or stem cell line itself that are influencing its behavior. What kinds of behaviors am I talking about? Well, the ability of that cell to maintain itself and survive, self-renew, decide what it's going to be, select a particular lineage or become restricted to a particular lineage, um, undergo differentiation, and even to migrate, maybe to migrate to areas where it's critical for that cell to go in order to be able to produce repair. So we came back after our initial experience with the suspicion that there may have been an issue in terms of cell manufacturing. And we wanted to understand how that could have come about. Are different stem cell lines very different or does how you expand them make a huge difference in terms of what their capacity is? But the very first question that we tried to ask, how different are different neural stem cell lines, we actually couldn't answer because there just weren't enough of them out there. And so in order to be able to start down that path, we worked with CIRM and we got a grant called a Discovery 2 grant in order to be able to make more stem cell lines and then compare them to one another try and try and understand what amount of variation was out there. So the question we asked um, was, is there a lot of variation? And the answer was resoundingly yes, as you can see here. Every one of these different colors in the plots represents a different stem cell line that we generated. This work was done by Katya Pilti in my lab, um, without whom we wouldn't be for sure where we are now. Um, and you can see when we look at different properties, how many stem cells they have, what their fate is, what kinds of cells they choose to become, whether they migrate or not, they're wildly different between these different stem cell lines. And so the answer to the first question is that they're very different, at least in a dish, suggesting that intrinsic variation is super important. The critical question we wanted to ask here is, are they also different in vivo? When we transplant them into a spinal cord injury model, will they all behave the same way? Or do these variations in properties in a dish carry forward to how the cells will behave in an animal model? And the answer is yes. So again, here are these same stem cell lines. Up is better in terms of recovery. And you can see that out of all of these, actually only three, the ones with these bars, gave repair in this animal model of function. We had three fails and three successes out of these lines. So that tells us that that intrinsic variation is really important. And it leads to a number of different questions on top of that. How do we know if we're doing scale up to go forward into clinical trial or cell manufacture to go forward into clinical trial that a cell, a cell stays the same when it undergoes that process, particularly under CGMP, where it's so different than what we do in a research laboratory? And so those properties of whether a cell stays the same are called identity, purity, and potency. So we wanted to understand those better as well. And it led us to ask the following question. Can we develop a fingerprint, if you will, for cell identity and potency that will help us tell what cells have the potential to be efficacious, to give a positive effect in an animal model, and maybe therefore in a human in a clinical trial, and which ones might fail? And so we used these lines that we had generated in order to try and construct a fingerprint. I'm not gonna talk to you about this slide just to say that it's really complicated the way that we chose to do this because it's complicated, not because we made it complicated. Um, and what we did is we looked at what's called the transcriptome of those cells. So 
all of the RNAs that they're making that could lead to protein production. And we compared cells that were successful to cells that failed. And we were able to identify when we did that, and this is work by Anita Lakatos in my group, to boil down all the way to just 24 genes. So these two lines over here failed. These two lines over here where it says positive were successful. These two lines for these particular 12 genes had almost no expression. The ones that were successful had a whole big bunch of expression. That's the red. Conversely, the cells that failed in this group of genes had a lot of those genes expressed, but the cells that were successful had very low expression of those genes. And so Anita put together a profile of these 24 genes that we identified in these experiments, and we made a set of new cell lines under CGMP. I'll come back to you in a minute. <laughs> we made a set of new cell lines under CGMP and used that profile to predict whether or not they would show efficacy. So out of these four CGMP lines, we predicted these two would show efficacy and that these two would fail based on those gene expression parameters. And in fact, that's exactly what happened when we went and did the in vivo testing. So we were dead on in terms of our predictions, and you can see that over here in terms of what the behavioral performance was. So. That's great, and it gave us a new set of CGMP lines. So using these data currently, we're trying to bring the best of those forward into clinical testing for spinal cord injury, to go back to that clinical trial paradigm and ask the next set of questions of whether we can be of benefit to people that have spinal cord injury. And this, of course, requires scale up and expansion and identity and potency and purity testing under CGMP. We we're fortunate to have a new CIRM grant, a translational grant, to be able to try and take that forward. That just started about a month ago, and we're actually already in process development um, within the lab here at UCI. So in order to get to the next step, if we're successful with our process development and our initial animal model testing under that translational grant, the very next thing that happens is we will take that cell line and go into the UCI CGMP in order to do scale up in cell production to support a clinical trial down the road. And so here I'm going to turn it back to Roberta to be able to introduce you to the UCI CGMP so you can get a seat feeling for what that is all about. Roberta, it's you. Sounds great. So um, so here, I just want to show you all uh, in California area, so uh, that we do have some GMP facilities at UC Davis, UCSF will open one in 2022, uh, UCLA and CD of Hopes, UC San Diego, and then UCI, it's pretty much around the corner. So. Uh, we need to keep in mind that it's not only in California, this is just for us to have a general idea, but we do have yeah, GMP facilities all over the place in the US, um, which, is, uh, which is a facilitate. So the, the, the idea is like, for example, if you have something on the East Coast, is for you to cover pretty much all the trials that is going on in that area. And if you're coming to, toward the West Coast, it's the same idea. So as closer if you, from, your, uh, from your center, actually. So you don't, you don't have any problem with shipping if there is anything, shipping wise will be much closer. So it's, it's, it's great. So every single place has one, either the Southern state, uh, like Texas uh, at Baylor. So um, uh, so we do have other places as well, but in California, we do have a couple of them, Northern California and Southern California that we keep at, the, at this point in time. Next slide, please. So this is our CGMP facility. So the area, which is, um, I will say, uh, uh, greenish somehow, some like a light green. It's it's a GMP facility. We will have a total of pretty much uh, seven manufacturer suites in a way that will be ISO seven. So this will be for us to do the manufacturers for uh, for the cell pro for the products. So we can do pretty much. Uh, the idea is we can do um, two products at this at the same time. So this is a, this is a still okay for us to do it. We just need to kind of like. Um, make sure that we will have uh, everything uh, well documented in a way that we can separate things and uh, and it, it should be okay to do that. So um, it's pretty much will be, um, we will be kind of like uh, serve uh, UCI faculty uh, members and uh, external uh, organization as well, commercial and in industry clients. And the important thing actually that I want to highlight it here, which, which is uh, extremely in interesting and it will be a plus for our facility, is that we will be performing training program for undergraduate students, students and grad students and postdoc fellows as well. So this is something that it's uh, in our, um, this is something that we want to implement 
and would be a plus because uh, they will learn actually that what's going the, the way that a GMP facility works. And this is this is something that I will say right now it's a need because uh, a lot of people that I already spoke with they they want to get involved and they don't know how to get involved. So this will be something that UCI will be providing to uh, this training program. Next link, please. So uh, our um, manufacturing capabilities, uh, we will be we'll be doing the technology transfer, which it's basically um, it's basically whatever it's going on in the regular lab. Uh, somebody from the from uh, from the facility actually normally would be could be myself or the senior scientists that will be involved with that. We'll kind of like uh, talk to the to the PI and make sure that we can transfer uh, all the technology up in in a, in a perfect way. And then once we transfer the technology, actually, we can start performing the manufacturing uh, in, inside the facility. So we'll be uh, working, we will be kind of providing also mammalian cell banking, so master cell bank and working cell bank, creation and validation of it. Uh, also will be uh, the process development uh, and optimization. I will be helping and my group will be helping with IND support. So this is something that uh, related to the CMCs that will be um, working on uh, in collaboration with, uh, with the faculty as well. And uh, from a GP perspective, we'll be uh, handling IPS cells, uh, CAR-T and ADK cell therapies, uh, adult stem cells and progenitor cells, which we include neural and retinal stem cells, and also providing a quality control service. Actually, if there is a need for anything, we'll be uh, providing that service as well. Next selling, please. Okay, and so with that, I'm gonna say thanks on behalf of Roberta um, and myself to all of you for attending tonight. I did just wanna highlight a couple of people, um, several of whom are in the room tonight. Josh David, stand up, take a bow. This is Josh, actually Josh and Katya Pilti from my group at the UC Davis CGMP facility, generating the lines that I told you about because the expertise to work on some of these very different cell products that we might have can't possibly be contained in one facility. And so one of the ways that we manage that is as we're moving along the translational pipeline from that bench to bedside is people who are working in the labs develop the expertise to do CGMP and work with folks like Dr. Marino, Roberta, in order to be able to learn CGMP skills and actually contribute to the cell therapy production. Um, on top of that, Brian Cummings, who's also here and started this work on spinal cord injury with me and did actually the very first transplants possibly in the world of human neural stem cells into mouse rodent models. And Rebecca, same thing. All right, so thanks to all those folks. Thanks to um, Roberta tonight. Of course, there are many, many others. UC Davis, we could not have done this work without how phenomenal the UC Davis CGMP facility was. It's one of the reasons that we're so very excited to have this getting off the ground at UCI to help not just me, but lots of other investigators here in terms of our internal pipeline. And as you saw, the many clinical trials that CIRM has sponsored over the last 10 years and which we anticipate are only gonna expand going forward. And so for UCI to be able to have a CGMP facility and really integrally be a part of that is hugely exciting. I'm not gonna go through all of these people, but I just wanna highlight, we have a really large group without which um, all of this would for sure not be possible. And um, in addition to our funding from CIRM, of course, funding from NIH and uh, a number of foundations like the Wings for Life um, Foundation. And then I just wanna end on this slide, which is our next upcoming uh, community lecture series. We are here April 12th. Our next lecture is May 10th, um, the impact of T cells in neurodegenerative disease and regenerative therapies by Craig Walsh, who's been um, just a phenomenal member of the stem cell research community here at UCI. With that, I will stop and we are open um, for questions. I'm gonna cheat and look at the chat box a little bit. Any questions from the audience first? You guys who showed up get dibs. Perfect, you got it. When you talk about infusing a million or a 10 billion cells, what kind of volume are you talking about? I'm just curious. Mm. So in animal models, I'll give you some, some scale, some perspective there. When we put 100,000 cells into a mouse spinal cord, we do that in one microliter. 
250 nanoliters in four injection sites. So in human spinal cord, um, the model was actually very similar in that clinical trial. So 20 million cells, but in four injection sites concentrated to about 100,000 cells per microliter. So the injection volume is actually pretty small. Great question, though. Got one over here, Bray. Oh, sorry. Fantastic talk. Thank you very much for your time. So in animal studies, where do you envision from the academic lab to the GMP facility that we would be required on what level of GLP, GMP would we be required for like a pivotal animal study to support an IND or an IDE, for yeah. example? So um, that's a great question. And so we had that one slide up there that kind of highlighted good laboratory practice and good manufacturing practice and good clinical practice, right? So good laboratory practice means things like, in fact, we were just talking about this in my group today. It means things like, um, you know, keeping incredibly detailed notes and backing those up. In fact, um, in the strictest criteria, you know, you're following, you have to follow the weights of your animals every day. You um, get your lab notebooks and um, those tracking sheets and the standard operating protocols that you've established all in writing in advance, as Roberta was talking about, those might get signed off every day or every week to make sure that all of the data is being tracked. So in the early stages of research, when we're doing true discovery research, Hopefully we're all keeping really good detailed laboratory notebooks, right? But we know that that doesn't always happen around us. But as soon as you move into a replication study or something that is has the potential to become a part of a study that is submitted to the FDA as a part of an IND application, an investigational new drug application and cell therapeutics fall under that category, then you're talking about providing thousands of pages of original data and it all has to be tracked and carefully signed off, and it takes a lot of extra personnel to be able to do that. But the cells don't have to be GMP at that point. The cells don't have to be GMP at that point. So your um, pivotal preclinical data does not necessarily have to be done with the GMP products. Now, Brian and I would argue that that's actually a weakness of the system. Um, in fact, we have published reviews on this um, saying that we feel like that's a weakness of the system. That because of the issues that we've talked about tonight and how critical scale up and cell manufacture and processing is and maintaining cell identity and purity and potency is, how do you really know that you got to an efficacious product at the end of that massive expansion that you're doing to get to a clinical cell lot unless you go back and test it again? So I think if you're gonna invest a million dollars or more in that process, you should spend 100,000 to go back and make sure that it actually still works in your animal model. Not a requirement. Go to someone on the screen. So let's see. Uh, Takumi Takahashi says, for animal studies leading to clinical studies, what level was required? Oh, it's sort of an overlapping question. Um, do you think we can rationalize not using GMP for animal studies involving an analogous product and not a human product? So yes, I think we kind of addressed this um, already. But um, I think the one thing that I would add that can be a little bit of a, um, a twist, at least in terms of studies that are for human neurological diseases and conditions, is that um, Oftentimes, there has been uh, a very logical pressure, a lot of discussion in the field about using large animal models or um, non-human primate models to add an intermediate step before you go to a clinical trial, right? So one of the problems with doing mouse spinal cord studies is our mice are about that big, right? <laughs> So this, the scale of what has to happen for a cell to be efficacious is completely different when you go to human spinal cord injury. And so um, a mini pig model, something that has you know, like a bigger area to be able to work through is something that um, we have struggled with a field for how to think about that. Because the corollary problem is that we don't have, we actually now have fairly good models of spinal cord injury in mini pigs but assessing their behavior and their locomotor function, right, is a little bit problematic. And so there are challenges at all of these scales. So do, do I think you should have to do a pivotal study in mini pigs with your GMP cell products that's your clinical lot? No. 
right? But I think you should have to do some sort of efficacy testing before, as a part of your release testing for that cell product. All right, Rick Robertson says, do you think the future of stem cell therapy will be patient-derived, aha, and hence patient-specific cell lines? Or will there be cell lines that can be used for any particular patient, in other words, allogeneic grafts, as long as the clinical challenge is the same? So um, we didn't really introduce those terms tonight, so I'll just spend a moment, bear with me if everybody in this room knows what they are. It may be the case that not everybody who's online knows what they are. So. Um, what Rick is asking about is uh, induced pluripotent or reprogrammed cells. So this is where we take a somatic cell from an indiv individual, a skin cell or a blood cell, back it up and tell it to behave like a pluripotent stem cell, and then take it forward again and convince it to be something like a neural stem cell, right? That way, my cells, if you take my somatic cells and deliver them back into me as a therapeutic, that's an autologous transplant self into self, right? On the other hand, if we were to take uh, stem cells from someone else, neural stem cells from someone else, grow those up, expand them, and then put them into me or someone else, that is um, an allogeneic transplant, an allograft, very much like an organ or tissue transplant is. So the downside with allogeneic transplants is that when you do that, you have the potential for rejection, just like you have the potential for organ rejection. If we do autologous transplants, self into self, we should be able to pretty much avoid those issues. So that's why there's a huge amount of interest and focus on reprogrammed cells to be able to do autologous grafting. The downside with that is that everything I just told you in terms of scale up and cell identity and purity and potency, everything is a one shot, right? And so it increases the potential that we're gonna have some fails there going forward. So I think the complication of doing autologous cell grafts is going to have to do with that. I think that is absolutely going to be the thing of the future, but I think that we're not quite there yet in terms of our ability to control those cells, back them up and bring them forward. At the same time, the other thing I would argue is that for um, allogeneic transplants, for allografts, what we really need to be able to do is induce tolerance to those cell bank, those, those um, uh, allogeneic grafts, so one person into another person. And actually, that's a very fruitful area of research. So I think the chances that we're going to be able to use banked cells and do allogeneic grafts that engraft are very, very good. But again, the research has to catch up a little bit. I will just give a little bit of an, an anecdote. I'm sorry, it's a super long-winded answer, but I do that. Um, and that is in that first study that I mentioned, um, which was done um, in Switzerland University uh, at the University of Zurich for the 12 subjects that got thoracic spinal cord injury transplants with human neural stem cells. Those were allogeneic transplants. The patients received immunosuppression just like organ transplants for a year. And when that immunosuppression was withdrawn at the one year mark, by about six months later, a number of those patients that had recovery regressed and lost their recovery of function. That's just what happens in the animal models. And so we had hoped that in human to human that there would be stable engraftment, but the data really suggests that unless you are able to achieve stable engraftment, you're not gonna get stable recovery. Another question from the room here, or I'll go to this No dice, really? All right. Uh, Greg Brewer says, what is the source for human neural stem cells? What sources have you studied to determine which works better? Well, um, we have studied uh, induced pluripotent cells, reprogrammed cells, ES-derived cells, and fetal tissue-derived neural stem cells. Out of those, fetal tissue-derived neural stem cells works hands down the best in our hands. Um, we have yet to have success in our hands, in our models, with an induced pluripotent cell, stem cell, a, a reprogrammed somatic cell um, uh, developed neural stem cell product. In fact, what we get really efficiently is tumor formation, which is very disappointing and not something that you want to have in the clinic. And um, the ES cells that we've worked with, embryonic stem cells that we've neuralized to be neural stem cells, um, have given, I would say, 50% of the lines we've tested have given some evidence of repair, but 
very, very small in terms of magnitude, nothing like what we've seen um, with the tissue-derived neural stem cells. You know, when I have high school students here, we'll talk for like an hour. So you guys are really disappointing. <laughs> Atena. Thank you so much. Eileen, do you think the fingerprint that you mentioned could be like applied at CGMP facilities, like with different stem cell lines, and then maybe be incorporated um, as part of these purity and potency testing? Yeah. So that. Our hope, and in fact, we're testing that as a part of the translational grant that we have right now. Um, Nate has been doing RNA isolations and learning to do this over the last few weeks. Um, so our hope is that we'll be able to use that fingerprint as a way to monitor um, cell identity and potency, right, through CGMP scale-up with our tissue-derived cell lines, right? Will that same sort of profile apply to an embryonic stem cell derived line or to um, uh, uh, induced pluripotent, you know, a reprogrammed stem cell line? I doubt it. Because I think those different types of cells are all capable of mediating repair for neurological disease and injury, for spinal cord injury, but I don't think they're doing it the same way. And so I think we'd have to ask those, make a bunch of lines and ask those cells the question of what are the things that you are making that, that are important. And that's a huge roadblock, right, for translational research and for monitoring things in CGMP. We don't have enough markers like that to be able to track and follow. And the challenge is going to be that I think those are probably going to be super specific to disease, the indication, right, maybe even to the time of transplant in terms of the model that you're using. And so developing them as a routine set of screening tools is not an easy thing to do because making that profile was th more than three years of work, right? Four or five years of work. Yeah. One more. It was the high school thing that got her. <laughs> Oh, thank you. That was an awesome talk. And I almost have too many questions, which is why it's hard to, to come up with the right one. But I guess from um, the perspective of academics, and we have funding sources that don't necessarily support all of the investment that would have to go into GMP level studies. Do you have any insight into like how academics can navigate that pathway and, and kind of like build up a team that is you know, ready to tackle these huge problems? Yeah, so that, I mean, that's a really great question. A, a lot of the work that I've described or that Roberta showed on that one slide, for example, of just, you know, where CGMP facilities are in, the, in California and where the Alpha Stem Cell Clinic Network is, what, you know, what clinical trials have been done. We're talking about things that can almost only be done in California. Um, because of the funding that has come through the California Institute of Regener Regenerative Medicine. It's not impossible to do them elsewhere. Actually, some of the work um, that we did in kind of phase one of these studies with the tissue-derived stem cells was funded by NIH. Um, so we had what's called a U Award, which is a clinical translation award. It's a very milestone-driven grant, just like a lot of these translational CIRM grants are. And NIH was fantastic in terms of partnering with us um, over this. So it's possible to do. Um, in fact, NIH has a whole institute called NCATS, which is built around partnering with academics to help them do things like derive assays that are going to support the development of, you know, maybe uh, some kind of pluripotent stem cell population to go forward to differentiate and move on through this process of, of moving towards clinical application or at least preclinical animal model studies. Um, it is definitely possible to do, it is a different kettle of fish than what most of us do in our basic science, what you know, we think about as being our bread and butter as academics, right? Um, but because it's hard, I think is not a good reason to not do it. At the end of the day, 
Discovery research is critically important, absolutely. But if you do only discovery research and you never move it down that pipeline, I think that's a huge shame, right? And so it's not just CIRM, it's NIH and of course a lot of disease-related foundations right now that are really pushing, challenging us as academics to think beyond that discovery phase and look out towards the rest of the pipeline. When I was in graduate school, that was almost like it just wasn't done, right? It simply wasn't done. Um, but now I think that landscape has changed a lot and the funding to enable it has come along with it. So in the end, in three years or five years, on CIRM's agenda is to have a whole CGMP facility network that's throughout California, just like the Alpha Stem Cell Clinic network exists. And again, part of that is to break down these barriers and make it more achievable to move down that pipeline. Awesome, thank you. And I'm definitely looking forward to the training and resources that are gonna be coming to campus. Online. Online. Uh, oh, oh my gosh, there's more. <laughs> uh, Rosa Okamura, uh, Roberta, boss. this is for you. Um, I don't know if you can see it, so I'll read it out to you and then you can answer. Um, you mentioned that process development should occur before entering the CGMP space, and you noted that process development can occur either in the research lab or in a GMP facility. Generally, however, discovery research labs are not usually equipped or trained to perform process development, and I didn't see a dedicated process development space in your map. Is there a dedicated PD group that can help investigators? Roberta, are you live? Yes, I am. Uh, so. Hi, Rose. So uh, the, the answer for your question is, <clears throat> so uh, from, uh, I'm not, so uh, talking a little bit about process development, ideally speaking, yes, it's for you to develop your, your, your regular lab, actually. And once you kind of transfer the, the GMP, it will be uh, just a tech transfer and we should perform the manufacturing. Uh, one, because the cost for you to enter the GMP facility is extremely high. So I will recommend if the, if the PI can do that, to perform this in their lab. And even though it's, uh, I will say, you can always start something and, and, and kind of like wrap it up in a way that you can transfer. But other places that I can't, not, not UCI, but other places that, are, that I, I, especially my old institution actually, they do have a designated PD lab, which is basically, they will pretty much develop, and develop the work there. Uh, UCI, there is no plan to do that. We just have a, we just have the manufacturer suite, and we, the plan is just to kind of do the tech transfer and, and perform the manufacturing uh, in, at UCI. But in case there is any need for any process development assistance, I will be happy to help in many different ways since I was involved uh, for many years on that. So if there is a need, please let me know. And I'll just add on to that. I think so. In my lab, we've done almost all of our process development activities in-house. I think that's true for a number of other investigators at UCI, like Leslie Thompson's group, for example, Brian's group, um, Magdalene Seiler's group here in terms of retinal disorders. Um, and the catch about it is that it's much more expensive because you need to shift over to using traceable reagents, things that you know will go behind GMP, right? You can't pick any random cell culture label that's the cheapest one out of the catalog. You're automatically working with the most expensive game in town. But you can do it with your expertise in your cell culture room in a way that is totally manageable. So the cost goes up, but it doesn't go up as high as it does moving behind Roberta's doors. Um, next question. I'm sorry if I missed this presentation. Oh, sorry, this in the presentation. When do you expect the CGMP facility and the student training programs to go live? Roberta, that definitely, definitely goes to you. Okay, so the, the, our, um, we, we, we're kind of like aiming for the, um, November because right now uh, we are finalizing the construction still and there is a, we need to get the license as well. So the drug manufacturer license for us to do any kind of cell and gene therapy um, uh, work. And uh, regarding the training program, I think once we are up and running, actually, we can start thinking about it in a way. We're already like getting some thoughts between Aline, myself, and Craig. So we do have uh, some ideas right now. And uh, I think it's just a matter of um, get the facility up and we can start thinking a little bit deeper on that. So, yeah. Yep. And again, just to add on, so the construction is anticipated to be finished in June. 
Um, and the licensing will be going on in the meantime, so the facility will go live um, as soon as possible after that. The follow-up question is whether international um, organizations, I'm assuming you mean academic organizations or students would be able to participate in training. Um, and Definitely. So I don't see why that's going to be a barrier. For example, in the Stem Cell Research Center, we run stem cell techniques training courses. People, um, at one time I ran a core facility with Rebecca in spinal cord injury work here. People literally came from around the world to do those courses. So anything that's in a certificate program kind of structure, which we're able to do, is something that we could expand out once we're able to be um, up and running efficiently and having that operate well. Um, Next, are stem cells injected along with specific factors that can enhance survival, growth, differentiation, et cetera? So I'll field that one. In our case, so let me back up one step. There are um, a couple of labs, Mark Tuzinski is most prominently um, at UC San Diego, who have used pluripotent derived cells to make neuralized cells, neural stem cells, transplanted in the case of spinal cord injury in order to get repair. And they use a very different model. So they take their stem cells, they inject them into the epicenter, we don't do that, and they pack them in with a gazillion trophic factors. Like everything that could possibly be tissue supporting that you can imagine. They get really robust engraftment, really robust growth of those cells. We did not do that. So only thing that our animals get are cells in a little bit of media and really small numbers of cells as well. When we started these studies, we were you know, trying to ask that really basic science question of whether, because believe it or not, at the time Brian did those first injections, whether you could make a chimeric mouse, right? So chimeric means a mouse that has human cells that has engrafted into the central nervous system in a way that's contributing to circuitry. And nobody had done that. We didn't know that yet. So from that very basic question came all of these translational things that came downstream, right? Um, so our question at that point was, can these cells engraft? And we're like, hey, they do it really well. Oh my gosh, these animals are getting better, right? And we stuck with that paradigm pretty much through. Um, next one, to you, Roberta. I was curious uh, how Dr. Marino gets her donations of T cells. How are donors selected? Oh, that's great. So this is talking about um, one of the things that happens in a GMP facility, generation of CAR-Ts um, as a potential cancer therapeutic. Of course, that's been really exciting over the last few years. So Roberta, take it away. Yeah, so this will be pretty much the trials that will be coming. So uh, selection-wise, this will depend on the, the, the clinical trial, the protocol. And, and then are we expecting, we should expect the, the sample to come from the cell processing lab, which will be, so the, the cell processing lab will be a lab that will be performing, they will get the apheresis and everything prior preserved, and they will transfer to the GMP facility. And then from there, we can, pick, we can, we can do all the manipulations on it. So this is the, the, the idea of the T cells. Perfect. And um, next question from the audience, Dr. Sid Golub, for those of you who don't know, is our director emeritus here. He is asking, um, there are many community medical practitioners offering some form of claimed stem cells for therapy. Will the UCI CGMP facility be providing cells to these stem cell clinics? And the answer to that is absolutely not. Um, so those direct-to-consumer marketing clinics, if you haven't seen any of those videos, we have a number up on our website where we've talked about that to the public. That is um, something that happens outside the domain of a clinical trial. What we're talking about here in terms of our CGMP is going to be supporting IND enabling or IND activities that are a part of FDA-authorized clinical trials with early stage cell therapeutics to test them and decide whether or not they have efficacy and can move forward. The critical difference between that and direct to consumer marketing is the evidence based part. And we want to make sure that we stay in that domain. Um, Errol asks, uh, CGMP looks and feels a lot like the early days of semiconductor fabrication. That's pretty true, actually. Um, the driving app uh, that drove manufacturing process in the semiconductor industry was the microprocessor. What could some of the driving apps be in terms of cell therapy? Oh, that's a wonderful question. Roberta, do you want to take that? Like, what technological advances do you see that could be a game changer? Um, so I, I will say, I. <laughs> The, the way that we're seeing, like, especially the cell therapy at this point in time is uh, thinking towards uh, 3D culture, which is uh, 
the, pretty much what people are doing, uh, which is extremely interesting. And not only this, we're kind of like going towards an automated system, right? So we want to first to somehow uh, minimize the time. So time is important because time is money, right? So as, <laughs> this is another thing. And uh, we want to minimize contamination. We need to minimize uh, the time. Um, and, and this is another thing that it's going towards that direction as well. So a couple of things that we are paying attention at this point in time that it will be interesting uh, to see in the future. Yeah, and I think that issue of automation is something that is particularly um, hot right now. And the other part I would add to that, partly because in the stem cell center here, we've recently added a number of hires that are in the cell and tissue engineering space. So I think the other advances we expect are about biomaterials, not just bioreactors or automated processing, right, but like layering on biomaterials and things that come out of the bioengineering space, and also 3D organ tissue, um, like organoid systems um, as potential sort of next generation um, cell therapies. Um, Jackie Tidball asks um, Roberta to you if in terms of the CGMP facility, how is this going to work from a practical perspective? I'm just kind of reducing her, her question down here. Um, menu of items, a consult, how do you get quotes? Like how will things work in terms of moving forward for people that are already here at UCI or potentially companies, right, that would want to come in and be able to make use of these services? The idea is to create, so we are coming up with a, a web page that will provide a couple of informations regarding uh, the, what we'll be offering from a service and a cost and everything. So this will help UCI members and actually our external members to kind of figure things out and see uh, which way they want to go. And actually equipments as well. So providing okay, what we do have and capability and everything. So this is the idea actually. We'll provide it. We'll provide it. All right, I'm going to give people in the audience a chance to ask a question because we've been doing a lot of online, so I'm just doing a gander around. Perfect. Hey, I was just wondering, in diseases that have like diverse presentations from patient to patient, I think there's been more of a push towards things like personalized medicine. I was just wondering how you see that playing into the manufacturing process, if at all, especially with like autologous um, therapies. Yeah, that is a great question. So we have, in in case anyone doesn't know, a new Institute for Precision Health here at UCI, um, which has a number of divisions within it. It's super exciting um, in terms of investments by the College of Health Sciences because this is absolutely the wave of the future, right, in terms of where things are going, not just here, but, but everywhere. Um, I think there are a number of, of ways where um, that has already played out in terms of CGMP. I could answer that, but Roberta, you might want to. Roberta, I wonder, do you want to comment, for example, on, on severe combined immunodeficiency in SCID? Because I know that's something that you've already worked with. Yeah, so I, I worked with any different kinds of protocol for CAR T cells. And to be honest, uh, even though we have like different, uh, this was autologous, right? It was, this was for, uh, for kids. So pretty much they, they kind of like, we never had any issues with the manufacturing, though, even though we had like different patients. So it was, at the end was no nothing actually. We always have the same, uh, even from a viability standpoint. So if the product has a, uh, the, the incoming product has a good viability. This is another thing that it's important though. Uh, we won't have any issues with viability later on. So I think we can uh, think in a different direction. It's not because we're having different donors actually that will might affect the, the manufacturing. This is not, I never saw something that, like this in my entire um, practice. And for the LVX kit, which is uh, for the sequels, uh, for the for the LVX kit patients, actually the same, which was bone marrow as a source, even though it was coming from babies in different uh, in different like months or one year or two years of it, I never had any issues. Come uh, even if we start with small numbers of cells, actually at the end we'll have enough cells. The the problem was never compromised. So I. Uh, so let me, let me back that up one step, um, if, if, if I can, and just explain, um, because everybody might not know what we're talking about here. So this is in the case where um, individuals, young kids typically, have a genetic defect that can be corrected by correcting their hematopoietic cells and then giving those cells back to them, right? So the very definition of personalized medicine. So you take a bone marrow sample, you do a genetic correction, you expand that, and um, transplant those kids back, which has been curative for, for severe combined immunodeficiency. So Don Cohn's work, for example, out of UCLA, which has been CIRM funded, 
led to a spinoff. There's actually a really interesting story that's out there um, if you search Dr. Google, who will tell you all about um, how transfer, tech transfer to companies can be really problematic because here we have a functional cure for kids that got shut down by the company that bought it out and got forced by California Institute of Regenerative Medicine because of the taxpayer dollars that were involved, they exercised their marching rights and said, no, you have to give up that IP so that we can continue treating patients. Um, anyway, it's worthwhile looking at that story, but absolutely personalized medicine is going to be a relevant thing there. And it can work. It has been um, a tremendous advance in terms of, at least at this point, some of those genetic-based uh, children's diseases. Um, I'm going to bounce back here. Um, Criteria for instruments. So, uh, Roberta, do you have, when, when, as we've been kitting out the CGMP facility, are there particular requirements that you've had to meet in terms of the types of instrumentation that you're able to use inside C CGMP as opposed to outside? Yeah, so normally, so for example, for, uh, for an electro operator, I'm looking for something like for Max site, which is already approved from the FDA. So uh, I will say we need, it's not all equipments that we can have it inside the GMP facility in case we need to adapt, which I heard this from Dr. Bauer from UC Davis, that he adapt the, the fax area. Um, it, it will take a paperwork for us to submit it in case we want to do something like that. But right now, actually, we do have a lot of equipments that we can use inside the GMP and will, will be, uh, G, it will be in, in compliance, so we won't have any issues with that. Oh, oh, hey, Vince. <laughs> That's funny. All right, uh, Roberta, what is the staffing situation in the CGMP? I think where he's going is, are we going to rent these rooms out to local companies? So right now, I already met with several different groups, uh, even from inside UCI and outside UCI. There is a couple uh, people that it's interesting. I did not uh, close anything at this point in time because we're still planning things around. So I will say uh, we are open for, a, for everybody. The idea is for, for us to provide any kind of service and open for everybody. Uh, and it's just like if you, if you do have something that you feel like uh, you want to bring to the GMP, please let me know. Um, we can help. And uh, this is the main idea. Yeah, so I, I think that we're envisioned to do mainly contract services, right, um, as the plan, as is the case for most um, GMPs. So, but that would be an individual conversation to have with Roberta. I think we've gotten most of these. I also think you guys have been very patient. People who are in the audience feel like they can't escape right now. So um, any last questions from the audience here? Perfect. It's a pretty general question. There's the different facilities over California. Are you all specializing in different areas? Is there a plan for that? Good question. Um, no, I think we're all trying to be generalists. Roberta, chime in if you think I'm incorrect. Um, well, the goal, though, is to take very much like the Alpha Stem Cell Clinic Network, which is CERM funded, and make a GMP network where you're sharing best practices, right? And maybe have the potential to do some particular specialization, right? So here, for example, at UCI, in terms of our um, translational, our preclinical pipeline, we're particularly strong in neuro. And we may have some expertise here for manufacture in the long run of neural stem cell therapies that not every place, you know, uh, in terms of CGMP facilities around the state is going to end up having. So that can be mean that we end up sharing best practice, we're training personnel across locations. But the goal is definitely for this to be um, with our eyes towards developing clinical translation and not towards being siloed, right? I think this is probably outside of this um, lecture here, but I'm looking at you're injecting these cells into like a damaged uh, spinal cord. How do these cells know what to do? I mean, wouldn't there be a bunch of different kinds of cells involved? Yeah. So um, now you've hit upon the thing that I like to do for my job. <laughs> um, so I will try and keep my long-winded answers a little less long-winded, but I'm glad to stay um, and chat for a bit. So um, just repeating that question, how do the cells that you inject know where to go and what to do? And actually, that is the 
foundation of all of the basic science research pretty much that goes on in my laboratory. And when we started these experiments, we really didn't understand that these cells were going to listen to those extrinsic factors, to the stuff around them. And so um, one of the things that we realized pretty early on is that surprisingly they were listening to stuff and we didn't know what it was. And it's a human that's true. And it's human cells, right? Listening to mouse cues. Um, so we have spent an awful lot of time starting to track down some of those factors that they're listening to. And one of the great things for me, I told you at the beginning in terms of my hitchhiker's journey here, that my lab at UCI started by studying the role of the immune system in the central nervous system after injury, which we didn't think there was much of a role back at that time. And because I was doing that, we had these specialized models and people came and said, hey, transplant these cells, right? But my passion has always been for those neuroimmune interactions. And in fact, it turns out that these cells that we transplant are listening to immune signals an awful lot. And we know that if we block those signals, we can change their behavior. We've identified new receptors based on those signaling factors that we've um, discovered that are interacting between the immune system and the neural stem cells that are there. And of course, there are many other things, including um, the mechanical factors that are present in the central nervous system, how stiff the tissue is, how squishy it is, what are the properties of the tissue that they're seeing. Cells, particularly stem cells, are exquisitely sensitive to all of those things. So they're listening to a lot of things all the time. And as we start to make progress in this field um, for therapeutic cells in spinal cord and in other areas, those are some of the things that we need to understand better. Because unless we understand them well, we're not going to be able to get to optimized um, cells with the potential to be the best therapies we can develop. Before you wrap up, Jerry Hugh has been very patient. Jerry, you've been very patient. Uh, will the banking service also be available for somatic cells, IV for a somatic cell product, uh, or is it only available for banking human cells? Well, yeah, so Roberta, go ahead, please. Yes, so it will be available for somatic cells as well. So we should be fine uh, to bank them as well, yep. Yep, but I think you have no plans to bank animal products, correct? Correct. Yeah, no yes. animal products inside the, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> we, that would be a hard line. <laughs> exactly. All right. Thanks to everyone for joining us tonight. Thanks to people here. Thanks for everyone who stuck with us online. Good night.